Okay, everybody, it's Mama Liz and Pearl Group here at Johnny Dodds, and we're going today to talk about contracts. And I know we've done this before. We're going to do it again, and probably again and again and again. We keep going over them. As most of you know, I do <coughs> preview every contract that comes into this office. Mm -hmm. I look at it, every ratified contract. And sometimes you may think they're ratified, and I disagree with you. But my favorite saying, nothing's a problem <laughs> until, until it's a problem. <laughs> so we hope and pray you get to the closing without it being a problem when we find these little hiccups. Because once you think it's ratified, your clients think it's ratified, we don't want to go back and make changes at that point. We just pray real hard that it's going to make it to closing. But I have here what is pretty close to a perfect contract, in my opinion. And I'm going to pass this out, and we're going to use this. And for those who are watching online, it is online. You can download it if you haven't already done so. It is right there on the site so that you'll be able to go over it with us as we're going over it. Agent whose contract this is does not know we're doing this. I did not I was wondering if share with her. her. <laughs> uh, you will find that when you get on the back page whose contract it is. But somebody like Susan's already on the back page. <laughs> <laughs> but I, did, I really wanted to go over it. It's a good chance for us to learn about contracts and to see really how well we're in contract. And this is Marissa Herrick, who is one of our newer agents. And I'm, a lot, several of my newer agents are writing really, really good contracts. And I'm real proud of that. And I think it's because they've come to the class over and over and over again mm -hmm. that we do that. So on the front page, of course, I have tried to write out, but hopefully I'm writing out all the names throughout it because we don't want to be publicizing the particular buyers and sellers. But this is uh, the only, I see one little hiccup on the first page, and it's a little hiccup, but anybody see what I see on the first page? Hopefully those of you watching online have downloaded it and you are now looking at it as well. I assume the city was filled in at one point, right? It was, yeah. The city was filled in. It is such a minor thing that it's certainly not going to affect the contract one way or the other. The word dollars? Uh, well, that's true. The word dollars is missing. Versus euros. Mm. Is, that how you write, is that how you're supposed to write the amount? 215,000? No, it's an and. Because uh, ands are decimals, not. The and is in the wrong place. Yeah. Oh. But as I said, that is so minor. Oh. And nobody would ever think that that's a problem with the contract. But it's just not the correct way to write a, a monetary amount. However, she did have it spelled out and the numbers, which is very important that you have both. One of the most common issues I see when contracts come into me uh, is they'll have the dollar amount, the numbers, but not written out. <clears throat> and why is it important that you write it out? It's very important that it be written out. Double check. It's double checking because it's easy to make a typo in numbers, right? You could easily make a typo. And if you have it written out and the numbers, then there's no confusion about what the price is. So it is really important to have it both ways. And she goes on to say that this is going to be by a combination of finance and cash. And it is contingent. Okay. And the terms are attached. Okay. And we go down the description and all these things. We get down to what's left for the property. The refrigerator stove, washer, dryer, dishwasher, and microwave. She was very specific about what was being left with the property. A lot of times people put in here... See uh, attached MLS agreement, if that's what you want, everything that's in the MLS. You cannot assume that everything that's in the MLS will go with the property unless you specifically address it. So if you say everything in MLS, you better attach the MLS printout as an addendum to the contract. Because remember, the basic definition of a listing agreement, it is between whom? The listing agreement is between the owner of the property and 
the real estate brokerage. It has nothing to do with the buyer whatsoever. Nothing. A contract of sale is between whom? The buyer. buyer and the seller. So that is a separate entity from the listing agreement. So you have to make sure you address it as such. And if your buyer clients are going through a house and they say, oh, I love that uh, chandelier. Well, don't worry, because the contract says it is going to be replaced with one of similar value. Don't worry about it. MLS says that. It'll be done. Not necessarily. If that seller does not want to leave that chandelier, they need to put it in the contract that that chandelier will be replaced or does not remain. Because that listing agreement, again, has nothing to do with the buyer. Now, yes, somebody could be accused of misrepresentation if they said they were going to sell something and they didn't, or said it's included and they didn't. But it really, an attorney years ago got my head straight on that when I was listing and selling. But you've got to keep those two entities separate. The listing agreement and the buyer contract are two separate animals. Randy? Well, even though the buyer, I mean the seller and the uh, brokerage are part of the listing agreement, once they put it in a multiple listing and say these things are for sale as part of the listing, doesn't that hold some weight? No. It still holds some weight from a marketing standpoint. But again, when the contract is actually written, that has nothing to do with what goes with the property. Yes, that's what they said they will sell with the property, but this is the document that certifies that. And if you don't put it in this, then it doesn't necessarily go. Yes? Okay, I have a question then. If you say C attached to MLS agreement, in that case, does everybody have to sign the MLS agreement or initial it or just if it's attached? If it's it? attached and the contract initial states that it's attached, Yes. Then I don't, it wouldn't hurt anything. It's always good to have that done. Okay. But it wouldn't be a requirement. Okay. But you also might do, if you say, see attached MLS agreement, mm -hmm. dated so and so. Okay. Because MLS well, agreements can get changed too. Got it. MLS, MLS, The next section is the closing date, and she's got November 24, 2014. This is a good chance for me to point out to you, please never, ever, ever put in here that the closing date will be within 30 days after the ratification of blah, 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 or uh, within two weeks of home inspection or two, whatever. In South Carolina, you need to have a specific closing date. Not all states are the same, but in South Carolina, they do require a specific closing date. Now, if you don't put a specific date in there, is that unnecessarily a voided contract? No. What is it? It's a voidable, a voidable contract. And you don't want to write voidable contracts if possible. Okay, and then the thing on that extension, I'm going to call your attention again. I've said this, so I feel like I'm blue in the face, but there are probably people that haven't heard it before. This uh, extension, automatic extension of seven business days in this contract means that if we get ready to go to closing and the buyers and sellers have both done everything they're supposed to do, but it can't close because the mortgage company has got to pick up, uh, attorney has got to pick up and get the title search done, or something like that. And that's when the automatic extension comes into play. It is not an automatic extension of closing date, period. It is not. It's only if it's something due to no fault of the buyer or seller. But if you have a short sale and the expiration date is November 24th, you must close by the 24th? I'll do an extension. Okay. Or do an extension. Well, on the short sale, you know, you're going to have problems due to the lender, probably. But is, is it going to be a lender of the buyer's choice? No. And on short sale, is a whole different animal. But if you've got a closing coming up and you know it's not going to make it, go ahead and do an addendum and extend the closing date and have everybody sign it. That's the simplest, best route there. On the top of page two, you're talking about who the property's going to be deeded to. And I've seen some of the more experienced attorneys, uh, agents are putting in here as to be determined by attorney. I don't really get that myself, but it's, it's some of them are putting that in there. Well, I would think the buyers are going to tell you how they want the property deeded. And that's what you would put here. It's how your buyers want the property deeded. And I've whited out the last names here for obvious reasons. Then the earnest money is $1,000. And she has here that zero is accompanying this offer. And 1,000 will be paid within two business days after the effective date. 
that's good, and she's going to that directly to be paying the money later. If the money were going in with the contract, she would have put where that zero is, she would have put $2,000 a company this, and with the thousand to be paid later, she put in of those two spots, right? Every blank on the contract should be filled in with something. So if you don't have anything to put there, you put in a. And in this case, agent owned realty is going to hold the earnest money. And I noticed that she has agent owned spelled correctly. Y'all notice that? Mm -hmm. One word. <clears throat> in zip form, sometimes it will trick you. You go to type it in there and it types automatically as two words. So you have to make sure you put it. And again, that's not going to kill a deal if you have it as two words. But we'd like to have it as one. The next blank, which has got $100. Yoo-hoo, she did it right again. Contracts that I reviewed every day, oh my gosh, I see stuff from zero to $600 to $1,000 the other day, and I thought, that, why would you want to put $1,000 in there? The purpose of this is if you have to go to a small claims court for interpleader action, if the buyers and sellers don't agree, you have to go. It's going to cost you $97 to apply for small claims court. And that's all we're doing is asking that we have permission to take this $100 or that file amount out of the earnest fund. So $100 is plenty enough to go in there. You don't want to put zero if Agent Owned is holding it. You know, and again, if, if somebody's bringing you a contract on one of your listings and they are holding the earnest money, I don't care what they put in there. But if Agent Owned is holding it, we want it to have $100 in there. It doesn't need to be any more than $100 because it's not going to cost any more than that. Okay? Mm -hmm. Going on down to your transaction cost. It's really spelled out correctly, I mean pretty explicitly in the printed material of this contract. So you would want to go over that with your buyers and sellers when you're reviewing the contract. The next line down it says buyer will pay transaction, buyer will pay buyer's transaction costs and seller pays seller's transaction costs unless otherwise agreed in writing. What in the world would you put in that line? See below. In it. Of either the words C below, S E E below, B E L O W. Either of those will work because nobody really knows why they put a blank there. When I talk to people who wrote the contract, the state people who did the form, they don't know why it's there. But a blank has to have something in it, it should have something in it. So you go on down. In the next paragraph, the little two line paragraph, is another one that I see day in and day out messed up. And how is it messed up? They don't check either box. So it's up for gas. Private public transfer fees and any costs similar to transfer fees, like capital contributions, conservancy fees, estoppel fees, otherwise named but similar fees paid to the owner's association are the sellers of the buyer's transaction costs. That needs to be one or the other. And I bet 90% of the contracts come from my desk have neither one of those box checked. So nothing's a problem, so it's a problem. And so, so if something comes up, then you have to figure out, well, who's going to pay for it? This contract didn't say. And I also had an agent arguing with me the other day saying, well, this doesn't talk about, this is not the, um, the special assessments for homeowners association. This is just talking about transfer fees. I don't think so. I think this is talking about any of those kind of fees paid to a homeowners association. That's the way I read it. So you need, if you're representing the buyer, more than likely you're going to have it be the seller's cost. If you're representing the seller, you're more than likely going to have it be the buyer's cost. And you need to know if you're selling in a subdivision that has that transfer fee. And Laurel, a lot of properties in this area, subdivisions, have a quarter of a percent transfer fee that's typically paid by the buyer. And that can be a oof when you get to closing if nobody's told you about that. Jill, did you have a question? No. <laughs> I just, I just, um, I've had a couple where I've had the sellers check and we still had to pay the, the transfer fee, mm -hmm. the, the buyer on the HOA. So I think if you really want them to pay, you need to write that somewhere else. If the seller should pay the just in. Well, yeah, you need to argue with, well, argue with the attorney over the seller and you got to do that yeah. because it specifically says who's going to pay it. But the HOA fee is different than a transfer fee, right? It is different. But it says public transfer fees. What is a transfer? I mean, transfer fee is a transfer fee. 
And I know some people are saying, well, the HOA has fees. Well, it is the HOA that has that transfer fee on most capital of the time. Improvement fee. I'm sorry? Sometimes it's like a capital improvement fee. Every time, time sometimes it's goes, 2500 5000 here. Thanks for moving in. Sometimes it's a, a lump sum on assessment. Sometimes it's just of a public record transfer fee. Mm -hmm. So I guess it could be argued, and that's what somebody's arguing if they make it the buyer pay it on top of this. But the way I read this, it says that whoever says you will pay it, will pay it. Okay. The closing cost, the next section is great in this contract because it does spell out specifically if you want the seller to pay part of the buyer's closing costs. You can either do the dollar amount or the percentage, either one. But if you do the dollar amount, then you put NA in the percentage. If you do the percentage, you put NA in the dollar amount. But it specifically spells out here, like if it's $2,000 and the, the closing costs don't come up to be $2,000, it specifically spells out what happens to that. It goes back, the overage goes back to the seller. And it's spelled out. It's a great, par great paragraph. Number seven, the finance. It's another, to me, I still don't like this contract finance section, but it is what it is. This one is, it says the contract is contingent upon obtaining financing, and she's saying 30 or 15 year or other, and she's got to be determined. I'm really not sure what that means. I guess they don't know if they're gonna put 10% down or 20% down. Uh, I'm not sure. Well, they may sell the house and pay cash. This is conditional financing, so. Then we go on to talk about, the one thing is she doesn't have equal to a minimum percentage. There's nothing in that blank. So what should be in there if you don't have anything to put? N A. But a lot of times the seller wants to know this information right here when they're determining whether to take this contract or not. So when I said this is not a perfect, perfect contract, in my opinion, this is one little thing that probably could be better written. The making the loan application within blank business days, typically five days is more than adequate because they usually have already done the pre qual or done loan app before they write the offer. So I don't, I saw one the other day that had 25 days for loan application. Wow. I said, what in the world? Uh, for number seven, what is a typical percentage of the purchase price? Well, typical, oh, thank you for that. You've been in my classes too long. <laughs> <laughs> Asking questions to make sure I cover what I'm supposed to cover. <laughs> uh, the percentage, this contract says, with loans equal to, in amounts to a minimum percentage of the purchase price or place value. Our uh, old contracts had minimum and maximum. And a lot of our agents are real concerned about this item, the only having minimum. But what the state has said, the people who wrote this contract, is that the maximum is assumed to be 100%. So minimum here would be 80%, 70%, typically either 80 or 90%, sometimes 95% if you're getting a 95% loan amount. If you, your person's getting a 95% loan to value, then put 95% here. If they're getting 80% loan to value, put 80% here. And the VA loan would be 100%. A VA loan would be 100% here. VA loan would be 100% minimum and 100% maximum, yeah. Right. The top of the next page is where I have a real problem with the contract. It's really saying that I shall provide the seller with reasonable, satisfactory loan approval that contains no credit income or asset conditions within blank business days from the effective date. The only thing that saves this contract, in my opinion, it goes on to say final loan approval occurs when lender transfers the funds. And that is the gospel. You're not going to get approval with uh, no income or asset conditions until you go to closing. You just aren't going to get it. So I really don't care what days you put in that spot. You can put 10, you can put 35, I don't care what you put in there, because it doesn't mean anything anyway. What I'd really like to see you put is NA. But sellers don't like that. They don't understand it, and they don't like it. So basically what you do is you put in there whatever's going to appease the seller. Because we know it's not going to make any difference anyway. And the lender in this case is Prosperity Home Mortgage. Yay. And it's going to be a conventional loan. She's got NA in the next spot. Now, 
It's FHA of VA addendum is is not attached. Obviously, there is no FHA VA addendum, so she didn't mark anything there because it's conventional loan. So don't bother with it. If it's not, if it's a conventional loan, you just leave it alone. I know here I go again. There's a blank left on the contract, right? <laughs> Number eight: repair procedure. She has done something on this contract that I like. She's lined out the whole section. Instead of just putting NA, and she did leave one blank with NA, but it's all lined out, so I don't think it makes any difference there. Because she's gonna use due diligence, and it just makes it perfectly clear to everybody concerned that this is a due diligence contract. It is not a fair procedure contract. And of course, due diligence is what I like and I prefer if you're representing the buyer, especially because I think you're doing them the, just, the best deal, best service by giving them due diligence so that you can check everything out. And they're not so many days to keep up with. I looked at the contract yesterday that had all this X'd out, the whole first first, oh, all of A was X'd out, and B was not X'd out. And they had filled in the business days, it said two business days. I don't get it. I mean, it doesn't make sense. And I have a lot of people that leave this in place and put, they'll put a date in for the inspection, they'll put in so many days to have it, the repairs done, or delivered, and they include a due diligence. They include a due diligence, and I'm thinking, okay, which one is it? Or some of them put the repair procedure in, and no due diligence, but right in the special stipulation section, this contract is contingent upon the buyer's home inspection at their sole satisfaction. What is that? That's due diligence. It's the same thing. And in that case, when you write that in there and you put no date on that, the entire contract is due diligence. You've got it forever. So I really prefer due diligence myself. Any questions about the repair, repair procedures, this section? And zip forms does have an easy way for you to line out these things, X them out. Number nine is another one that everybody seems to have trouble figuring out what to do. But it says here that sellers will make the property accessible for inspections and not unreasonably withhold excess unless otherwise agreed in writing by the parties. Seller will keep all utilities operational through closing unless otherwise agreed. I bet 80, at least 80% 80 of the time I see contracts where they write on this where it says other, they write in there, seller agrees to keep utilities on. It already says that. I mean, it doesn't hurt to repeat it, but it don't need to repeat it. Yes. So, so, on that point exactly. So, so we don't have to check either of them if that's what we wanted. That's right, because the contract is already saying that. Okay. So just leave that go. We don't. And, and there are other than you just go NA if we left if we want if they've already got everything on. Right. Okay. Now. I'm one of those persons that thinks that. It, you know, it says this one's checked here. Seller grants permission to connect utilities. When that is checked, you would assume that utilities are turned off. When you're showing the property. So they're going to make the buyer pay for the bills from that point forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they will. If the buyer connects it. Okay. Price value, which is the next page. Oh, by the way, that section we just left uh, about the inspection rights, that section covers your uh, right to have a walkthrough inspection which, you know, we all want to do walkthrough inspections. Never, ever, please never go to a closing where you have not done a walkthrough inspection. That's section nine, maybe. Oh, section nine, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Somebody one time said this contract doesn't give us the right to have a walkthrough inspection. Well, that number nine specifically gives you the right to do what that. What about someone like we this person that denied wanting to have a walkthrough <laughs> If somebody denies wanting to have a walkthrough, I make them put in blood. Yeah, they sign in blood that they, were advised to have it and they chose not to. But even with that, you just beg them to have one. They really need to have one. And if at all possible, you as an agent don't do it for them. I mean, because you're taking that responsibility on your shoulders that the house is okay. You want them to do it. We had a situation one time where, what was our listing sold, another real estate company brought the buyer and we closed it. They did not do a walkthrough. The agent said, oh, they were too big a hurry. They just arrived from Europe or wherever it came from. And they just didn't want to do it. 
they were too tired, whatever. So they went to close and forgot to walk through. When they were moving the house, they were horrified. They said the house smelled like urine, it was just horrible, and they couldn't live in it, and blah, blah, blah. I said to the agent, well, we asked you to have a walkthrough. And as a matter of fact, we talked to her about the walkthrough before the closing. But it still was a lawsuit. So you just need to encourage the other agents, even though it's not your buyer, it's your listing, you want to encourage the buyer's agent to do the walkthrough. That's taking some liability off of you. Some agents say, well, I don't know, that's raising red flags. Why would I want to do that? Just what I just said. It's a kind of lawsuit sometimes. So you don't want that. You want them to do a walkthrough and be satisfied before closing. Page four, the appraised value. Hopefully, most every house now is contingent upon the appraisal. Even if it's a cash deal, we advise you to make it contingent upon it being appraised. And we are having a lot of cash deals these days, but you still need to have it appraised, in my opinion. You are not an appraiser. People say, oh, I can tell them what it's worth. I wouldn't go there if I were you. You're not an appraiser. Yes, you can give a, a good guesstimate, but you shouldn't rely on that. You should advise them to have an appraisal. The wood infestation report is another place that causes problems, it seems like. A very experienced agent had me look over something for him over the weekend, and I was looking at it, and he inadvertently had marked, uh, if the property be sold, has been previously occupied. This contract is contingent upon the buyer having the property inspected at their expense with an operator chosen by the seller. I don't think he really meant to do that. He didn't mean to do that. So be careful what you put in there. If you want the buyer to, to select the operator, that's the second one, and the seller to pay for it, that's fine. But a lot of times we have the buyer pay for it and the buyer select who does it. And this thing, this closing, it, the, the letter will be presented no later than blank calendar days prior to closing. It's the only spot in the contract that talks about calendar days as opposed to business days. And remember that the CL100 letters are only good for 30 days, so you have to make sure that you have it in there. And 10 days is a good number, I think. Works well there. And going down to the home warranty. A lot of people seem to be confused about what to put in here. Parties agree that a home warranty ordered by blank. Now this one says the buyer, and that's fine. Uh, sometimes they put the buyer's agent or the seller, depending on who wants to select it. But typically it would be the buyer with at least 12 months of coverage. The closing date will be provided by closing and the cost will be paid by the seller. And they put the pro proposed home warranty and the type. You always want to put whatever type it is. They've got the Global Home USA Elite Plan. It's always good to put, put the amount, but also put the plan that you're looking for. Obviously, we're not going through all this words of the printed contract, but on the next page, page five, the property disclosure. Pay attention when someone sends you a property disclosure. Usually it's online, you can print it off for the listings when you have a buyer. Uh, an agent came to me yesterday and showed me this property disclosure that was printed off the internet. It was obviously they had other offers on the contract, on the property, and they put a new disclosure up, and two pages of it was for, already signed by another buyer, and the other part wasn't. You should pay attention. When you print it off, look at it. I mean, obviously you don't want to do anything with it, but give it to your buyer, but this was a mess. And they thought they had a ratified contract until all of a sudden she was looking in more detail. Kind of a mess. <coughs> Number 19, um, the broker may or may not place the earnest money into an interest bearing account. She's got may, it doesn't really matter what you put there. Agent own does not put their escrow money into an interest bearing account, so typically you put not. But it doesn't really make any difference because we're not gonna put it in there anyway. But when you put not, then you make the buyer sure that they know it's not going to an interest bearing account. State law allows you to do it, but you don't have to. You don't have to. No. The state law so you just want to put may here or may not? May not. May not. So, that's so as I said, this, you know, if I had to say perfect, I would say I would rather that said may not, but this is pretty darn good contract, you'll have to agree. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Moving on over to page seven. Come to page seven. She's got the following things that are included. The due diligence addendum, sale of buyer's real property contingency addendum, and the addendum one, which is a kick-out clause. That is redundant. You didn't need this kick-out clause, but the other agent insisted that they write their own kick-out clause and put with it. But it's no big deal. It says the same thing that the contingency agreement said, so that is included here. One thing that I would prefer to see on this is you go down to number 31, the expiration, that's fine. And then going beneath that, where it says, it witness whereof. In that it says, if the signee is not a party, appropriate legal documents are attached or to be delivered within blank business days. In this case, the seller was an estate. Was what? An estate. Oh. Okay. So I think there should have been some documentation showing that these people had the authority to sign for the estate. Mm -hmm. That's what this section is for in the contract. To my knowledge, we didn't get that. I haven't seen it if we did. But Would that be a specific <coughs> power of attorney or just a trust document? It'd be the settlement thing executive of the state. Because I believe that's the way they said trustees is what they, this person signed as. So, so they need something showing that they had the right to do that. How many business days would you give them? Typically, they should already have it. So two business days should be plenty. You know, if they've got to go get something drawn up, then they've got a problem. They'd have yeah. to change that. They shouldn't be signing the contract anyway, unless they already have something, giving them that right. Well, I guess when you did your prior interview, you know, you might ask those questions. Are you signing it for yourself? And if not, like a trust or a estate, we need to put some paperwork on that. Exactly. Okay. Let them know up front. The next page is all filled out beautifully. Everything's done correctly. It's important to have all that information there on that page. And you notice everything was talking like docu sign here, or loops, dot loop, or whatever the other agent used. Even uh, Marissa signed for the earnest money with, but now that I will have to ask her, I don't know if she got this earnest money the day it was signed, because it said it was gonna be delivered in two business days. So I'm not sure exactly when she signed that, but that would be, be careful not to sign that you have the honest money unless you have that baby in your hand. Somebody says, I'm gonna bring it to you. Well, you don't sign that you have it until you actually have it. So that's a little bit of a concern that I'm not sure that she should have signed that there. But I'm not sure, but I can't tell when she signed it there. The due diligence addendum, she has 10 business days for that, which is good. And the termination fee, zero. If you're representing the buyer, put zero in there. Now, if, this, if you're asking for a long uh, due diligence, 20, 30, 40 days or something, then let the seller come back and ask for some money. Keep it off the market that long. But if you're representing the buyer, you want to put zero and see what you can get there. Typically, 10 business days is plenty long enough. That really, 10 business days is a long time. Mm -hmm. Don't put a dollar in there for termination fee. We had that happen one time, and the agent had to chase them and keep on giving them a dollar bill. I mean, <laughs> it said, you just don't put a dollar. Yeah. The thing to keep in mind about the due diligence, I'll caution you, it's awesome, I love it, I think everybody should use it if you're representing buyers, but please be careful if you've got 10 business days in there that you know how to calculate business days, and you determine when your time is up. And can y'all tell me what time of day on the 10th day is this up? 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Not 5 o'clock, not 7 o'clock, 10 a.m. It's when it starts and that's when it ends. So be sure if you have any questions, let me know. I'll help you. The sale of the buyer's property, this is a very confusing addendum, very I think. Very. I'm sorry? I think very, I agree. Very confusing. I don't what they want. It's very confusing. This contract is contingent upon the marketing and closing of the sale of buyer's property, identified below, no later than blank business days prior to closing or at closing. Now, if you're representing the buyer, probably the best thing to put there is closing. But if you are on the seller's side, the seller doesn't want to see that. 
The seller says, I'm going to make sure that deal is closed before my closing so I know it's going to happen. So we were discussing the stand up and I was discussing that this weekend. And so five business days is good, two business days, whatever, something like that. But five business days probably make the seller feel good. But a lot of times these closings are going to happen pretty close together. Okay, and notice of each sales agreement signed and notice of the closing delivered to the seller and brokers no later than blank business days after each sales agreement is signed and to blank business days after the closing occurs. What this is saying is it's contingent from the sale. Now, in this case, this property was already sold <laughs> under contract. It was already under contract, but she, it doesn't say that here. But if the contract, if it's already under contract, then you'll say it's contingent from the closing, not the sale. But she's got contingent from the sale. So what they want, this is saying is that within two business days after they get a ratified contract on that property that it's, the buyers are selling, they will notify the buy the sellers of this property that they have a contract. And they will notify of the closing no later than two business days after that closing has occurred. These two things are talking about this buyer's seller's property, buyer's own personal property he's selling. It is confusing, but that is what they're talking about there. You go down and you put the property address in, all that. As a primary residence, that's pretty simple. Closing the sale is required for the buyer to obtain financing. The property is listed with a real estate company and you put a general realty there or whatever company is listed with. Okay. The buyer property is not currently for sale by owner, pretty easy. The buyer's property is currently under contract, which is not attached. So really in this case, she's got it contingent from the sale, but it really is only contingent from the closing because it is already under contract. Okay, Jill? just a quick question. So on the last one, let's say it's not currently on the contractor, still trying to sell it, and it goes beyond the first date of November 24th on the front With the closing? Day. Yes. So we didn't sell the, the house by November 24th. What do you do then? Do you redo this page or do you do an addendum? Do an addendum to extend the closing date. Then this goes on to talk about marketing and other offers that comes in. During the buyer sales period, the seller may continue to market the property and may accept any offer as a backup contract. Mm -hmm. If a subsequent offer does not contain a buyer sale contingency, upon delivered notice, the buyer shall, within blank business days, deliver written satisfactory evidence that the buyer's property is under contract with sale to close with the buyer's sale period. So, as how many days is the kickout clause? You do two, two business days, to me, is plenty of time enough. Because if you put a long time in there, then you just let them shop your contract. I just think that two business days is plenty of time for that. I would prefer to have eight hours or four hours if I'm representing the seller. I want as short a period as possible. If you're representing the buyer, you want as long as possible. So it depends on where you are in, in the process. Jill? Last one on this. That's okay. Okay. So so you, you have one of these contingencies. So and you're the listing agent. Okay. So do you, is it does it stay active or does it act contingent after you accept this? So what does it go That's as? That's a good question. The question is if you get one of these, do you leave it um, active in the MLS or do you put it active contingent? Right. MLS rules are you go active contingent. Yeah. Now, I think it's do all the agents do that? No, okay. but they should. It's, what's so frustrating is if you have a buyer coming in out of town for just the weekend, mm -hmm. they fall in love with this house, you write an offer, and then find out it's already under contract. Yeah. That's not good, and that's unethical. Okay. You should do it, the MLS rules are you put it in an active contention. Now, when you do that, you have to advise your seller that more than likely it's not going to get shown very much. Because if I've got some out of town people coming in, I'm not showing that property. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show one I know that I can get under contract. Any other questions about this? And the next page is the kickout clause, which says exactly what this contingency of them already said. And the other agent, by insisting on this, what was that other agent doing? Unauthorized 
practice of law, which law in the state of South Carolina we cannot do. And the attorneys are very strict about it. So what we try, we have to use the state forms that the state's already all blank. We're allowed to fill in the blanks, but we're not allowed to write our own verbiage. And this is something that's become a lot stricter in the more recent months than it used to be. As a matter of fact, for those who are watching and listening online, there's an attorney, I mean an agent up in the Spartanburg Greenville area that actually went to jail for an authorized practice of law. They were arrested. Now that's taken a little extreme, but it happened. Okay. So I, if I were you, I would not practice law. I don't like good, I don't look good in pinstripes. That kind of pinstripes anyway. <laughs> Any other questions? Any questions about it? Any other questions on this contract? Or when y'all see Marissa, you'll have to congratulate her. Tell her job well done. Okay. I have one question on the. Um, let me find that page. When it's an estate, um, and we were talking about the number of days until they provide the paperwork. One page. That could be seven. on either side too. Could it be the buyer or the seller? That was my question. Um, which number, page are you on? Uh, number page seven. Page seven. Page seven. Uh, 31, where it's oh, oh, uh, yeah, okay. Um, what if you okay. know it's an estate sale and you're representing the buyer? Do you need to check? You want to make sure you're representing the buyer. You want to check this box that, um, well, it says it is attached to, to be delivered. You put you to be delivered within blank business, but two business days okay. or three business days. If you know it's an estate or a trust situation, then you ought to go ahead and put that in there. Okay. Because you you want to know proof that they have that authority to sign. Any other questions? You know, saying as a state, uh, we were just notified that our title insurance company paid a claim in Orangeburg County. The um, owner of the property passed away and for two years, the property was still assessed at the 4% ratio. And the county called it. And, and the property had already closed. And the county called it and billed the new owner for the, the difference in the, um, in the time insurance. Yeah. Oh. And it was over $4,000 a year. Well. The, our title insurance company negotiated with the county and they cut that in half. But I'd never thought about that before about when somebody passes away, it, what it puts the property assessed at after that. See, I haven't thought about that either, but does it six percent? Interesting, something to remember. And that's another good plug for owner's title insurance too. Because if that person hadn't had owner's title insurance, that wouldn't have been covered. Right. We had a situation here in Mount Pleasant with Rob Donaldson's office, and Rob did a closing, and the Charleston County sent a notice to him that the taxes were paid. So he had it in writing from the county that the taxes were paid. They closed. The next year, the new owners got billed for the other previous owners' taxes, which was $3,200 or something like that. So they went to Rob, and Rob went back to his file, and there it was. But you know what the county said? Tough. We make mistakes. You still owe the money. So the title insurance company stepped in and took care of that because it wasn't the buyer's fault. It wasn't anybody's fault. That's just what the insurance was for. So every time, any time you have an opportunity to strongly encourage your buyers to get owner's title insurance, please do so because it can come in very handy. Anything else? 